Good evening. Hey, it's Birdman Mel here, and I am so very, very happy that you joined us tonight. And you're going to be too. And you know why? It's because we have our most popular guest speaker going to be with us. And it's not just going to be a speaker. He's going to be taking questions like we always do. And I'm tickled to death in just a few minutes, just very few. Stan Tequila is going to be here, and we're going to be talking about migration. And gosh almighty, what a timely subject. I know it's going on with the hummingbirds in my backyard. And speaking of that, hey guys, keep those hummingbird feeders up like we've said. And uh, here in mid-Missouri, you folks that come into Songbird Station, I got to tell you, some of you have said, hey, they're gone. No, they're not. I had, you know, 12 to 18 tonight. And I believe, I truly do, that we'll help them a lot by keeping those feeders up now until, you know, next week when that cold front comes through and it's 40-something, yep, they're going to thin out. But let's help them put that body weight on so they can migrate. And Stan will be talking about stuff like that on all kinds of species in just a second. Remember, tell us where you're from. Doing that lets us help kind of tailor the program to you. And it also increases your chance to win prizes. We're going to be giving away some of Stan's books some feeders, some of the things I show you here tonight real quick because we do have a new weekly uh, feature. When I've got speakers on, we're going to just take three to five minutes and hey, I want to tell you about some of my favorite functional feeders, although tonight's are kind of functional and gifty, and some of my favorite gifts. So uh, I'm going to hop into that in just a second, but tag a friend. Tell them about tonight because they are going to love hearing from Stan. Birdman Mel, you've heard from him, on, you know, now and then, and we have some fun, but this man knows what he's talking about. Ask some questions as we go, and we're going to give you a chance once in a while, so answer some questions, and all those things help you win the prizes I spoke of, okay? So uh, the other thing I'd like you to do is, if you can, let us know if hummingbirds have left your area, because, you know, we set up that birdmigrationmaps.com, and we're going to try to run that thing backwards, and remember next spring, let us know when they show up. It's a way for us to gather the track the birds without you getting emails from people trying to sell you stuff and without, you know, having to go to the, a website because we're all about helping you find things from your local retailers. And a lot of them have the products I'm going to show you. And I got to show you this. You're going to say, Mel, this isn't a functional feeder, but I love this feeder. I, you know my favorite seed. That's the first question. Somebody tell me, what is Birdman Mel going to put in these mesh feeders? I love this guy because, you know, my wife likes to decorate. Well, what better than doing some fall decorating with a sunflower or a uh, the scarecrow here and filling it full of, better have your answer in, okay, sunflower kernels. They can just set all over this, the chickadees, the nuthatches, tip mice, everybody does that. I love it. Remember the first one I showed you, and we renamed this guy, you know, Bird's Revenge because they go pecking on this old cat's belly. But I love looking out my window every morning and looking at this guy smile back at me. So have some fun. Go to your local wild bird supplier. Ask him about one of these mesh feeders for gift essentials. Now I'm going to talk about a couple of the other gifts. We happen to not just be a bird company. You guys have figured out we're Songbird Essentials. Well, we actually have evolved into a family of essential brands. Gift Essentials is the other one. That happens to be the brand because these are kind of gifty. We also do some things like this is a really neat lantern, and I'll have it lit up next week. I should have thought of that. That is a great uh, lantern that Margaret Cobain, that does our Cobain birds, she did this scene here. And it's called, uh, I think it's the uh, Stonewall Snowman. And I love this. And we have all kinds of things, hostess sets and that. And then we also have these great candles. And uh, it looks, you know, you can hear in the back, you can hopefully see it. Or These are just... Uh, these battery candles, and they look very, very pretty all lit up. So keep them in mind. And you know, there's another part of our company called Entertaining Essentials. That's where we have things like, you know, this is a, uh, I guess you'd call this a bottle stopper for a bottle of Buzz, or it could be in a, you know, an olive oil bottle, whatever. But everybody likes this bee guy and this cardinal guy. So if you want to find out about our family of essential brands, keep coming to Songbird Essentials, go to Gift Essentials, and check out Entertaining Essentials. But remember, we're not sending you there to sell you products. We want you to see what you like and then tell that local retailer in your town and say, hey, would you consider getting some of that stuff from Old Birdman Mill? And we'll send them their way. And you can support that local guy who's there for advice for you every day. And he'll have these books that Stan and I love so much. And speaking of that, I had to bring it, Stan. And we're going to have to talk one of these days. We talk about this guy like he's just a bird man. Well, this rascal, he knows wildflowers. And in Missouri, we're blessed. He does a book, I believe, on wildflowers. I use his tree book as well as his bird book. And he has that in several different states. And I'm really excited. 
with a lot of you starting to, you know, bird for the first time, Stan came out with a new series called Beginning or Birding for Beginners. And it's a really cool book. Same color coding and things that those of us that use the bigger book for the state of Missouri. I use this Missouri book all the time. So keep these in mind. If you're a beginning birder or you want a great Christmas present or any kind of gift for somebody that's just starting, I love these guides. That's the end of my commercial. Let's get on to the good stuff. And we're going to be talking about bird migration. So Stan, are you out there somewhere? I heard you're up in Minnesota. I'm here, Mel. How you doing tonight? Hey, you're looking good. <laughs> I'm glad you think so. <laughs> you might be in the hey. minority. <laughs> no, no. You know, we talked about the fact that I thought I saw some nighthawks the other yeah. night. And I have to tell you, I had a bunch of, I, I don't know what they were. They just got by me. We were sitting having our morning coffee that I tell folks I like to have while I take that moment to listen to the birds sing. Uh, but migration is certainly going on all over, and, and there's some neat things going on and, and some neat things to know about what's going on. So fill us in. Well, Mel, the, um, I love the subject of bird migration, first and foremost. It is, it's one of these topics that is, um, on the surface of things, pretty straightforward, pretty basic. But when you dive into it, when you learn about it, it becomes um, one of these things that is like, incredibly complex with so many nuances to it and so many interesting aspects and uh, avenues that you can explore with uh, migration. And I just absolutely love it. Um, so right about now, here we are in September and uh, uh, you know, near the end of September, and we're pretty much in the throes of migration. Migration uh, uh, started in August uh, with the shorebirds and then moved into early September when we're seeing our smaller birds like the warblers and such that are starting to move and towards a end of September, we're seeing uh, bigger birds uh, starting to move out now too. You had mentioned nighthawks. Uh, uh, here in Minnesota at Hawk Ridge, the other day we had over 40,000 hawks pass over the ridge in one day. Wow. So, yeah, it's a, it's quite a spectacle. Uh, and so this is quite a subject. So let's, let's, you know, spend some time talking about bird migration. It is a, like I said, a fascinating topic. Let's, um, Let's jump in. I got some slides to, uh, for everybody to look at here. We're going to kind of start with this. I'll share my screen and we'll start looking at these things right here. Now, let's see. You tell me, Mel, if this is working for you, if you guys can see that. How does that look? Looks good. All right. So um, it really, it's the incredible journey of many uh, North American birds. It is a, uh, it's, it's one of these things where uh, people see it. They know about it, uh, but they may not understand it. Um, and and then you get a lot of people who will ask questions like, um, uh, you know, how did this start, or why did it start, or why are birds migrating? Uh, you know, those types of things. And I always like to joke because, you know, like if I was a warbler and I was in the in the tropics, I mean, why would you leave? <laughs> you know, I mean, it yeah, makes no sense to me at all. So there, are, we don't know the answers uh, to this. Uh, we just simply don't know. Um, but our best guesses, our, uh, our kind of our hypothesis of things, uh, um, is is kind of laid out here. So uh, basically, migration uh, evolved over millions of years. Now, I don't know about you, Mel, but I have a trouble remembering last week, let alone you know millions of years, because um, it, it's it's kind of a thing where it's it's hard to wrap your head around those types of you know, uh, time expanses uh, that are really, really difficult. Um, but so the thoughts behind migration is that it allow birds to kind of expanded their ranges in other areas where there's more abundant food, there's new habitat and things like that. One of the things we don't think about when it comes to migration is the glaciations that have affected the earth over the years. Uh, uh, you know, 10,000 years ago, Mel, right here in Minnesota, I'd be under an, uh, about a mile thick of ice, uh, certainly not habitable to you know, people or to birds. And so it, it really changes it. And when there was that much ice locked up, it's estimated that there was about um, an extra 400 miles of, uh, of a shoreline around different areas of the United States, where uh, because there was less water in the ocean is locked up more in the, uh, in the snow. And so it exposed different areas. And so birds certainly weren't doing uh, migrating to Minnesota at that point. Uh, and then only after the, after that glaciation has retreated, did uh, you know uh, the birds kind of move back in. They slowly kind of move back into areas like that. 
So they were, they, what they were doing in this migration is they're gaining suitable habitat uh, for, for breeding with less competition uh, from other birds, new food sources and such. Um, because again, you got to think about it. Why would you, you know, why would you fly, say, you know, you're a hummingbird and you're here in Minnesota and you got to go down to the tropics. You know, it's like 1,200 miles and you're a tiny little bird. You know, I mean, how does that equate to being worthwhile going, you know? And then, of course, what happened is, is that uh, many, many studies have shown that um, where a bird is hatched is its kind of home range. And that hatched area is uh, where they oftentimes return to. And so they're going to return to areas that, you know, are within a couple of miles usually of that. Uh, for example, um, I, I like to use uh, common loons, for example. Minnesota, it's our state bird. And, uh, and we have them on our lakes here. And those birds will um, uh, migrate down to the Gulf Coast, and then they'll come back to the same exact lake in which they're hatched on. So those hatching areas are very, very important. Uh, we're learning more and more about that too. For example, uh, birds that are hatched uh, in a specific, like in a box, you know, if you will, a, a, you know, like a bluebird box or a chickadee box, uh, the, the type of box that it was hatched in, the shape of it, and, and now we've actually learned that the color of it, uh, the birds, when they return as adults to breed, well, they will prefer box that, boxes that were similar to uh, what they were hatched in, in the same color as like they were hatched in too. So, so basically, cool. uh, go ahead, Mel, you had a question there? No, oh, I, that's pretty cool. Okay, so, that, so basically migration is a winning strategy for survival, okay? So it comes down to this, if the cost of migrating were more than the benefits of migrating, it, migration wouldn't have started at all. So the reason why it continues on and why it, it keeps going is because it does provide a benefit for these birds. So at least 4,000 species of birds migrate. That's 40% of all of our bird species here in North America migrate. So uh, about 350 total species. And that's pretty darn good, you know? So it's yeah. like, you know, that, that says to me, that um, if it was an anomaly, you know, a, a couple of birds here, a couple of birds there, and they were doing this thing, then it'd be like, it, it's almost like a monarch butterfly. It's kind of an anomaly for butterflies for the monarch to migrate. That is really unusual. But in the birds, it's fairly common at 40% of all the species. Uh, so here in North America, about 350 of those uh, of our species will migrate uh, down to warmer areas, you know, so wintering grounds or uh, quote unquote non breeding grounds. And, and, and maybe I should jump in and say right now that one of the things that people don't quite understand about, you know, the migration is, is that these birds will move up into northern states. They will breed. Uh, and, and this, I mean, this goes for Missouri also. They'll come in, they'll breed. And then when they go south, they're not breeding again. This is not. Uh, they're not like, well, we'll go down to Mexico and have kids again. They don't. They rest in the winter time, and then they come back up and they migrate and they migrate back up and they nest uh, in your backyards, which should show you, which should be obvious to you, why your backyard is so important to these birds, whether you're in Missouri or Minnesota. This is why it's important that we have clean, healthy, you know, backyards that provide. Uh, shelter for them, food, and water. This is really, really important stuff for them because they're, like, they don't get a second chance at it. They don't get to go down south and start all over again. So, and I'm not sure that's something terribly understood or, or, or not. But, so. hey, hey, Stan, I, I got a couple questions. I got to really say an amen to the water. I know when I first see Orioles, a lot of birds that are migrating, almost always, uh, many, many times those guys are around one of our water features that make a yeah. significant water sound that they can can hear from above mm -hmm. but i want to make sure i get a quick question to you julie uh and i think julie's probably here in missouri if it's who i think it is ask what is the best time to listen for migrating birds at night well um <clears throat> we're going to get into that in a little bit about migrating at night because that is a that's it's kind of a essential part of of bird migration when they do it and how they do it okay so uh we'll, we'll let's talk about that when we get there but it, it it's really 
once you realize what's going on while you're sleeping in bed, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Should I go on or do you have another question? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll throw two others out yeah, and, and we may very well hear these. Eric mentioned, he said he's still, and I'm not sure where Eric lives, I should, but he said, I still have brown thrashers and gray yeah. cat birds. Yep. Will they migrate south or will I have them during the winter also? They and somebody mi- else asked, yeah, do migrate. ospreys go south? Yes, and ospreys, um, so <clears throat> I've got, um, I live on a lake, got about 30 acres on a lake, and I have osprey nesting, and my osprey have actually already left. Uh, so for, for Minnesota, you know, of course, the migration starts a little fur- a little sooner the further north you are. And um, um, the, you know, for, for somebody like me in Minnesota, the migration starts a little, my osprey are already gone and they already took off. Um, things like uh, the catbirds are still around for us. So catbirds in Missouri are still gonna be around. They're gonna eventually pull out of there. We're gonna talk about some of those because some of those birds are not true migrators. In fact, that kind of leads us into this slide that I have up here. Um, not all migration is the same. And that is very, very important. Too often migration is thought of as just a north to south movement, very predictable, timely, we can, you know, we know exactly what they're doing, and that's really not that true. True, it's only uh, uh, true for the the complete migrators. So this is what we've got: we've got complete migration, we have partial migration, we have eruptive migration, we have non-migration, which, by the way, is a migratory strategy, and then some birds that are nomadic. So let's take a look at these types of things. Complete migrators; these are the ones that you can really count on. They're the ones who, like the scarlet tanager. Blackburnian warbler, any of these uh, species, they're true neotropical migrants, those two birds, and they go all the way down to the tropics, whether you want them to or not. So the warblers, the tanagers, these are birds that are very highly migratory, and they take these big, long trips every single year, no matter what. Now, having said that, uh, these, you know, kind of typical uh, uh, migrators, the things like rough-legged hawks, are also true migrators because they nest up in the Arctic and then they come down to places like Missouri or Minnesota, the Dakotas like that for the winter time. So just because they don't fly all the way to the tropics doesn't mean that they're not a complete migrator because these guys do a complete migration because they they leave out of their northern territories and they go south and, and go south. Those are complete migrators and complete migrators are kind of what Everybody thinks of when we're thinking about migration. So, and here's a good example of it. So common loons are complete migrators. Again, I like to use the loons. I'm here in Minnesota and it's a good way to do it. But we often think of migration as a straight line, head straight south, you know, just by the compass and just go straight there. And we couldn't be more wrong. Uh, in fact, uh, we have um, tagging on uh, quite a few of the loons here in Minnesota. And what they do is they don't actually go south, but they go east. They go, um, they leave Minnesota and they head east until they hit Lake Michigan. And, uh, you know, Lake Michigan is a big lake, obviously. And they'll hit Lake Michigan, land there, and they'll start to feed. And believe it or not, a lot of them will spend one to two weeks swimming south. (laughs) Not flying, swimming south, down Lake Michigan, (laughs) heading down towards Chicago, and then when they pass by Chicago, they run down to what? To like Gary, Indiana. And I don't know about you, if you've ever been to Gary, Indiana, you know, you'd want to leave too. It's time to get up. No, yeah, it's time to get up. And they fly and they'll start flying from there. And now we've actually changed. Uh, people have actually changed some of our birds' behaviors. For example, uh, all of the freshwater reservoirs in um, uh, Kentucky and Tennessee and, you know, kind of that whole region uh, uh, are now providing winter homes for a lot of, uh, of loons that are heading south. They won't uh, continue on uh, down to the Gulf Coast. About 90% of our uh, loons in Minnesota go down to the Gulf Coast. Some of them will jump over uh, the Appalachian Mountains and go over to the East Coast, but about 90% of them uh, don't. So it, it's really kind of an interesting thing. So it's not this real like, okay, let's head south and let's go. In fact, it's not like that at all. They, they kind of meander and they go back and forth and, you know, they'll go to different areas and, and uh, it doesn't seem logical uh, when you get down to the nitty gritty of tracking them where they actually go to them. 
So it's kind of a neat, neat little kind of sidebar, if you will. Yeah. All right. So um, <clears throat> then we have partial migrators. Uh, what I find hysterical is um, the American robin, Turtus migratoris. That's its genus and species name. Uh, indicates that it's the it's the bird that migrates, and yet uh, <laughs> it's really a species that only partially migrates. Uh, studies estimate that about 10% of the robin population doesn't migrate at all. In in Missouri, I'm sure you have plenty of, of robins in the winter time because we have them here in Minnesota also. And you know our our winters a little tougher than your winters, and we still have robins here. So not all of them migrate, and and a lot of them only go as far south as they need to kind of get through the winter time and that's it. So really these are not that true hardcore, you know, migratory bird like our uh, warblers and our uh, tanagers and things like that. So other birds like red-tailed hawks uh, are also, uh, will only uh, migrate as far as they need to. They don't need to, uh, you know, get into, you know, the tropics and so they don't have to go that far. Why, why go that far if you don't have to? So partial migrators are, are common all over the place. Mel, I'm thinking of another partial migrator uh, that's very popular that people like, and it's the eastern bluebird. Uh, they are not true migrators. Uh, they're going to move just as far south as they need to kind of make a living, uh, find enough insects to get them through or enough dried fruit to get them through, and then they're going to head back. Now, the reason behind all this, this migration, things like with these partial migrators, is that they can turn around and get back to, our, um, uh, to the breeding grounds faster. Because every study shows that the sooner, uh, the, or the, not the, so the sooner and the first ones to get to the best breeding grounds are the ones that are most successful at breeding, too. Us boys race up there, don't we? It is. It's always the boys, too. And so it's, uh, the women are just way too smart. And uh, the guys <laughs> are just not smart enough. A bunch of boneheads, us guys. And we just kind of yep. like, yeah, charge. <laughs> you know? Yep, we got to be first there and secure the best spot for our sweetie. There you go. So um, there's an interesting case study with house finches um, that really kind of showed that birds adapt very quickly. House finches are originally from the America Southwest. So California, Arizona, New Mexico, and things like that. And in the uh, early 1900s, uh, uh, the males in particular, and some of the females were, were captured and they were brought to the East Coast and sold as a caged bird. They oftentimes called them the Hollywood finch uh, they called them a couple of different names, and they were sold in the market. Um, it was a, you know, it's, the male's a pretty bird. He's, he's red, you know, and he's, they sing a great song, and so they were sold uh, in, you know, on the market basically, like a canary would be. Mm -hmm. And uh, but they were a native bird. Uh, when the laws were passed to protect migratory birds, including the house finch, these birds were released, uh, uh, you know, and because they didn't, <laughs> they didn't box them all up and ship them back to the to the Southwest, they were released on the East Coast. And in New York City is where they first started uh, to establish themselves in the early 1900s. And it wasn't long before, guess what they started doing? They started moving South and West. And they've kind of moved across the United States, setting up. Now, these are not true migratory birds. They're partial migrator and um, they kind of moved in the areas. And I remember seeing the first house finches here in Minnesota in the 1980s. Um, and it was all of a sudden, here's this brand new bird. And, right. uh, and it's kind of moved in and they don't they don't mind people and they nest in flowering baskets that hang on your porches and things like that or on your on the wreath on your door and things like that. So it was really an interesting scenario. Uh, just over basically about 100 years, uh, movements of house finches are quickly changed and uh, and they kind of repopulated whole different areas. And that was really based on what people had done to them. So it's kind of an interesting case study looking at what these birds uh, are capable of doing, too. You bet. Hey, I got a question from Go Lyle Turner. He asked, do birds migrate at the same altitude, or does it change with storms or wildfires? And Linda in Arkansas asked, will sandhill cranes migrate? So sandhill cranes are migrators. Um, let me, let, let's do this. I'm going to jump ahead. Try this. And let's just answer that question by going here, and then we'll go back to the other thing here. Uh, so let's just talk about it, because this is the second question we got about um, migrating at night. So the vast majority of our birds migrate at night. Uh, our daytime migrators are the larger birds, like a sandhill crane, for example, or the birds of prey, like hawks and, owl, or, and eagles. Owls, owl, there's some owls that migrate, but they usually 
tend to uh, do it at night. Um, so big birds, uh, like the sandhill cranes, like that migrate during the daytime. They use, let's see, do I have a thing here? No. Use thermals or rising columns of warm air help propel them along the way. But they have big wings that allow them to spread their wings and fly, you know, uh, on these uh, weather conditions that allow them to get a free ride, basically. However, most of our small birds, warblers and the thrushes and, you know, uh, uh, you know just all of our tiny birds, hummingbirds and like that, they migrate at night. And uh, that might be a surprise to a lot of uh, people because as the sun is setting, the bird gets ready to go. They take advantage of the uh, weather conditions. So if the winds are strong out of the south, they're not going to migrate. But if the winds are out of the north, helping to push them along, they'll do that. They'll jump up and they'll get going on these uh, on these kind of nighttime flows. And there's a lot of good reason to uh, migrate at night. Uh, one, the feeding during the daytime. So basically what happens is these small birds, whether it be a, I was photographing white crowned sparrows, uh, uh, excuse me, white-throated sparrows just the other day. And I posted a bunch of pictures of these white-throated sparrows on my Facebook page, so if anybody wants to see these. And they're migrating right now. They migrate at night because during the daytime, they got to stop, they have to feed, they have to find food. They're in a new area, they've never been here before, they have to find food. So they have to you know, feed and feed and feed all day long. And then come nighttime, guess what? Then they get ready to go. Doesn't leave a lot of time for sleeping. Um, and, and that's a question I get that a lot is people, well, when do they sleep? And I have to explain the differences between mammals, which, you know, you, you and I are a mammal versus birds, very different uh, anatomies are very different uh, requirements for things like that. And they don't require the same type of uh, sleeping that mammals do. So, um, so they rest during the day and they feed during the day. At night, there's more favorable atmospheric conditions. So less turbulence. Remember I talked about the sun shining warming up the ground, huge columns of warm air coming up. This is providing these, you know, really rocky uh, rides for them. So at night, the winds are more laminar, they're flat, and it, it, it's even easier for them to flap because those little birds, they can't soar. So if you're a white, uh, white bird sparrow and you're flapping away or you're a, you know, a hummingbird or something like that, you can't glide. You can't just, you know, so you have to flap all the time. So having flat air uh, currents is very, very helpful. Um, uh, during nighttime flight. Now, now, go ahead. May I jump in? Yeah. Lyle's question also asks, well, what about the effect of storms or wildfires? Uh, uh, I, I, let's talk about the wildfires uh, later because that's really a big deal that's going on right now. And storms do affect them a lot. Um, major storms and uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, major storms really affect bird migration a lot. It really influences which way the birds go, which, uh, which kind of migratory pathway they take because there's different pathways up the country. And uh, so storms are a huge influence on uh, these bird migrations. They really are. So okay. uh, in addition to that, um, uh, the nighttime uh, migration is they get cooler air temperatures. Think about it, Mel, if you're like this, you know, flapping your arms up and down and up and down, you know, you know, how many times per minute, you're going to build up some heat. And so helping to fly at night uh, in cooler temperatures helps the birds to not overheat while they're, um, while they're flying because it's a nonstop uh, flying. Yeah. It'd be like, you know, running a marathon all night long. There's less predators at night also. And navigation by the stars is perhaps easier uh, than using uh, geography. So those are some reasons why they do it. Now you can kind of see most of our birds here are going to be flying in the four, about the two to 4,000 foot range. So it's not very high. Um, some of the daytime flyers like Canada geese, uh, bald eagles, uh, and cranes and things like that, they can, they can migrate upwards of 20,000 feet. Uh, so that's quite higher. It's a different strategy altogether to migrate during the daytime than it is to migrate at the at nighttime. Questions about that okay. one? Sounds good. So getting back to the different types of migrators here, we're kind of running out of time, I see too. Um, we, have, uh, we have the unpredictable migrators. These are eruptive birds. So we see this oftentimes in bohemian waxwings, red-breasted nuthatches, and like great gray owls. Um, these are usually thought of as uh, uh, the reason for it is either food shortages or food abundances. 
um, or uh, like last week, they put out, I don't know if you know about this, Mel, they put out the uh, Canadian uh, seed crop uh, prediction. So in other words, they're looking at all the um, uh, evergreen trees and they're mm -hmm. trying to decide, is it going to be a good year for pine cones or not? Because, you know, you got spruces, you got pines, you got uh, you know, all these different species that, and because the winter finches rely on those cone seeds for their food. And if it's a bad year, they're going to predict a lot of, of our northern finches are going to come down into the United States. But if it's a good year, they don't. So these eruptive birds, uh, and that's eruptive with an I, they migrate kind of now and then, here and there, every, you know, three to five or seven years. And they're not predictable. They're really tough to predict exactly what it is. I saw a red-breasted nuthatch at my feeders today. So, you know, that's a good that, sign or a bad sign. So, now, what did they say in the report? And that would say that, because that guy would normally stay north, wouldn't he more or not? Right. The red-breasted nuthatch uh, has a history, though, of showing up very early in the migratory season and then disappearing. So this seems okay. to be right on. And the report, by the way, last week was that it's an excellent seed crop and there won't be much of a winter migration this winter for the winter finches like pine gross beaks and evening gross beaks, and, you know, these types of things, and pine siskins and all those birds that we hope to have come to our feeders, but they apparently don't. Okay. So what, Another eruptive species is the snowy owl. Uh, the snowy owl every five to ten years shows up and uh, and kind of you know thrills everybody that they show up. But not every year. It's just a now and then. Uh, one study showed 800 snowy owls collected by museums across the United States revealed that over most of them, the vast majority of them, were immature males that mar migrated the furthest south in the winter time. And there you go. Once again those guys they're not the smartest you know <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow so and then you have your non-migrators uh your you know your your white breasted nuthatches your chickadees you know your titmice and all these types of things and they have a total different strategy because because they're not migrating they have to have things like grow more feathers have an extra layer of fat they have to cuddle together at night to keep warm and they have to go into what's called a torpor at night and i think what we're going to do is save that torpor for another talk, when we get into the colder weather, uh, Mel, you and I will, will talk about winter strategies for how birds survive uh, uh, cold temperatures like that. Yeah, and that's last, coming up on October 8th. So looking forward to having you back then. Yeah, we'll do that then. Uh, lastly is the nomadic species. These are like the goldfinches. Uh, they're true nomadics. They wander around the country with no pattern, no seasonal patterns. Uh, birds that are in uh, Texas in the summertime can end up in uh, uh, Minnesota in the wintertime. Uh, they're, they're kind of uh, unpredictable in what they do and how they do it. So, so um, looks like we, I don't know, how, how soon do we have to wrap this up? I was going to talk a little bit about. Or, or your, count, your, your, your count's holding very strong as far as the number of people that are still on. And several of them are saying, hey, man, this is interesting. So let's go oh. ahead and talk a little longer, okay? Okay, sounds good. So what prompts birds to migrate? And this is one that is in the news right now um, because people are trying to figure out, oh, should I take down my hummingbird feeders to force them to migrate? And that is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Really what these birds, uh, the cues that allow or that kind of set these birds in motion for migration is really the photo period. The photo period is the amount of daylight from sunrise to sunset. They are able to take in that information because it's really the most consistent thing. It's not the availability of food. It's not the change in the weather. It is the daylight because every year the weather is different. And every year the food crops are different and things like that. So what's consistent? What is something that the birds can rely on to give themselves a real, you know, kind of a, a solid, uh, you know, reason to go? And that is the photo period, the amount of sunlight from sunrise to sunset. And that is what really kicks off hormone productions in the body that gives them their uh, um, kind of the, the restlessness that they need to start migrating. I, I have a picture of a peregrine falcon on here because there's an interesting study. The peregrine falcons were nearly wiped out across the United States and they were reintroduced. But when they reintroduced them, they had to find them, they had to find you know, wild ones and bring them into captivity and breed them. 
So they found some wild ones on the, uh, actually were down in the Carolinas, and then some were up in the Arctic. And what they did was they bred these, uh, uh, these uh, you know, base, they're still peregrine falcons, but they're from two different regions. And what they found was, is the ones from the Arctic uh, migrated and the ones from the Carolinas didn't. And so what happened was the offspring had a mix of some of the offspring would migrate and some of the offspring wouldn't showing that some of this uh, migratory uh, abilities is like that is in their genetics. It's kind of built into them too. So it's a really a fascinating topic. We can't get into it really deep here, um, but um, it's just one of those interesting, interesting things. Um, I'm going to stop my share here and kind of bring us back uh, uh, to it. I just want to basically just kind of sum it all up by saying that the bird migration is something that you should get out and experience for yourself, whether it be just a, a V of Canada geese flying over or watching warblers kind of move through. Migration is amazing time and amazing uh, of kind of one of nature's most uh, of marvelous feats. And we can see it just by simply going outside at this time of year and observing. Stan, thank you very, very much. Lots of great information. We do have several questions that I've not given you that you and I agreed that I would immediately uh, answer the ones that, that uh, fit uh, me answering. And, and uh, uh, I'll ask your help on some other ones. So those of you, Lau, Janice, Nick, Eric, we got lots of questions here from quite a few of you. Hey, stay tuned. We will get those to you. And uh, while you stay tuned, uh, please uh, reach out. Let Stan know you appreciate him being part of us uh, on this show tonight. We would sure do appreciate it, Stan, very, very much, as I also appreciate Gavin here in the studio running it for me and Erica back behind the scenes that will help post things and the winners and all that. And the last thing I wanted to remind folks is uh, we're coming down to the last week on our contest where we wanted you to promote and show us your photos of this guy, hummingbirds, and also your videos the same way. And we're going to pick a winner. Uh, and in the next show uh, here pretty soon, we'll be announced. I guess next next Thursday night, we'll be announcing who wins your choice of either the bird bath or the uh, uh, stained glass piece here that we're going to have. So keep those photos and videos coming in, and uh, it'll just increase your chances of winning. Did want to tell you that what's up ahead for next week. I'm very blessed to have one of our most popular guests back, uh, Jim and Julie Lundstedt from here in central Missouri, just have a way of talking about a subject that keeps you captivated, like Stan. And next week, they're going to be talking about owls, you know, those in our backyard and beyond. So stay tuned for that. You're going to love it. And uh, the other thing I want to remind you, you, you know, we talked about Stan's books tonight, and I showed you some products. Make sure you go to that local retailer in your part of the world. And if you can't find one, you reach out to old Birdman Mel at either birdmanmail.com or at one of our websites and or call in and we will find a, a local retailer near you that can give you not only good products, but also great service and advice locally. So uh, do all of these things uh, and it's our hope that it will help you have a better way of, you know, taking that moment today to listen to the birds sing because it truly is a stress reliever from God. Thanks everybody for joining us. Stan, thanks again. All right, Mal. Thanks for having me. You betcha.